I do see a new, you know, some new faces, so I kind of wanted just to introduce myself. I'm the Four Seas Ministry Leader, which means I oversee recently, right, the nursery through the youth. So eighth grade, but then I also oversee our youth group GF that we, we meet. That's usually, you know, sixth grade through high school. And the curriculum that we embrace and we teach in the classrooms are the same ones that I teach. And the reason is it goes book by book, right? It's not jumping around. It's not topical. It really just gets us into the word. Um, I like to ask questions. And the reason I like to ask questions is because I like to know that you're engaged in what I'm giving you. You're actually absorbing a good portion of it. I'm going to try to do that here, so please, if I ask questions, don't shy away from being quiet. Please answer away. You know, it might not be picked up on the mic, so I'll just make sure that I reiterate whatever you say. So, And please understand, right, Pastor Anthony, all that, when I'm up here and I'm learning and I'm teaching, I'm still trying to scrub myself, right? I'm still taking that in. I'm not better in any manner, right? The word is still working through me. And the only difference is, is I've been studying for a couple weeks to be, you know, be prepared for this lesson. And the Lord was just using me. And I could have, when you, when you really study, it's never ending. As far as the Lord wants to take you, he will. And I had to, you have to stop eventually in your lesson because you'll never get through it. Because the amount of information and the amount that the Lord is showing you. Because this day versus the next day versus the week changes. And the Bible is everlasting and living, right? So it always impacts you in that day. So what I'm saying is... When this message is given, it's still speaking to me the same way that I hope the Lord speaks uh, to you. But most importantly, let's open up and then we'll get into our lesson in prayer. Thank you, Lord, just for this time. Thank you for bringing us together. Just thank you for your word, Lord. Just be with all that are traveling. Be with our pastor. May he just be blessed. May he just be having a great time uh, with Gail and just be with us here, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. We lift up the families um, that lost you know, loved ones in Texas. We lift up our family members here in church that are going through things that maybe the church doesn't know, Lord, but be their strength, be their hope, and help them through it, Lord. Um, we love you, we praise you, and may you just use this word to strengthen everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to go forward, right? Because some of you weren't here on Wednesday. So a few weeks back, I was teaching on the account of Judges, but we were focused more on God using Gideon. And during this time of Gideon, the Midianites were the enemy that were oppressing the Israelites. And God called Gideon to be a judge. And he wanted Gideon to lead the Israelites out of oppression, right, and battle against their enemies. Now, the Midianites, the Bible says that they were a vast number of people, right? They were a vast army. It says that they, they were like locusts in the valley and whose camels were like the sand of, a, sand of the seashore. We saw God starting to prepare Gideon for battle. And the way he did that is he reassured Gideon by strengthening his faith, right? How many, when you read through Gideon, you see that he keeps asking for signs and wonders time and time again. But what was awesome about and why God chose Gideon is he was willing to be obedient, right? That, that's what God calls us to be. Be obedient and I'll help you along the way. But he can't help you along the way if you're not willing to, you know, be obedient to what he's going to ultimately instruct you to do. So God instructed Gideon to pull the surrounding tribes together and build an army. So there you see Gideon blowing the trumpet. And here's the first question, right? How many came out? That day, when he blew that trumpet, how many men came together to jump into this fight? Very close. 32,000 men, right? So 32,000 men came together. Now, the Midianites, they started off with 135,000. So 32, 135, we figured the math was, what, 4 to 1? Did, was God happy with that number? Did God say, okay, well, let's blow that trumpet again and maybe we get more? Or did God say, well, that's too big, let's go the other way? What did God ultimately decide? Too big or too small? Too big, right? It's too big. So God said, whoever was afraid in that army, Gideon, tell the men, if you are afraid, you can pack your stuff and go. 22,000 men were afraid and they left. That left 10,000. Now, God looked at that army and still said, still too big, right? I want you to take the men down to the river and the way that they drank the water from that river would de decide, will they be with me to fight or will they not? After that happened, they were left with 300 men. So here comes another question. Why did God send such a small army against such a massive army? 
right? Why wouldn't he give him 150,000 versus 135? Why did God want to shrink that army to an impossible number? Yeah, so, and everything, that, that's all right, right? To show his glory, but yes, he wanted, he saw the men's heart, he saw their flesh, and at 32,000 men, they still would take the credit for themselves, right? Even with that type of number. So God had to reduce it to a number that was beyond them being able to take that type of credit. It says that God knew that the people would claim the victory for themselves. He didn't want that. The victory belonged to God and not the people. But what we started to see is that Israel always fell into this cycle, right? The, the cycle of judges. And it's still something that we battle with today. So it's not a cycle that has now changed and it's different. It, it hasn't evolved because flesh is flesh. And the cycle went like this. The Israelites would sin. What was their problem? What was their major sin during the Old Testament? Adultery, right? False worship, right? Worshiping, worshiping false gods. God would become angry, and he would ultimately have to punish sin, right? Because he's a just God. So he would send an enemy against them. Those enemies would oppress them for years until eventually the Israelites cried out and said, you know what? I've sinned. I repent. I'm going to cry out to God. We no longer can live under these conditions. So then God would raise up a judge to deliver them, and the, Israels, the Israelites eventually would enjoy peace and rest. That period lasts for 300 years. And sad to say, during the period of judges, there were 14 judges that had to come in this way to deliver the Israelites, right? From judges all the way through 1 Samuel, being Samuel being the last uh, prophet, priest, and just, right? And judge. So what happens next is the battle is won. Gideon, and uh, he's ruled for 20 years, and he eventually falls into idolatry. And the people follow him. So we're going to start in, and start reading in Judges chapter 8. So Judges chapter 8, verse 23 through 27. Now remember, the battle has been won now. Everyone is celebrating. The, the enemies are no longer around them. So Judges chapter 8, verse 23 through 27. It says, But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you, that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread them out on the garment, and each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earring that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were around their camel's neck. Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city in Ophrah. And all Israel played the harlot with it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his house. So immediately we see Gideon has to tell the people of Israel, no, I can't, I'm not your king, right? Yes, God delivered you, but they were always pushing for that physical king. And what happened here is he said, no, right? The Lord, the, the Lord deliver you, but, right? And that's the issue. But what we're going to do is we're going to make an ephod. And an ephod was basically a royal breastplate that the high priest would wear. He wasn't called to be a high priest. He was called to be a judge. And throughout Old Testament history, we always see the Israelites struggled with, idolat uh, struggled with idolatry. They always wanted an immediate and present God or God in contrast to right Yahweh, their one true God. They always love man-made gods, and so do we. We're, and we're not opposed to it. We always want the easiest things, not the hard things, right? Man-made gods always impose very little. They didn't require a lot of your life. They're generally very convenient versus, right, a life that's fully dedicated to God. And we know that it involves a changed heart. But we see here, he made an ephod. Maybe he made it as a trope, some, something along those lines, but we know God didn't instruct him. But the Bible said that it was going to be a snare. And anyone that's done hunting and those type of things, I love watching those discovery shows and how they catch little rodents and rabbits and stuff with those little nooses, right? That's a snare. It's a trap. So it says, the ephod became a snare. And this verse stated, all Israel played the harlot. Now you'll see in the Old Testament, 
harlot, prostitution is always used in reference when, God, when uh, false worship is there. And the reason is, is because it always involves some type of pagan sexual ritual or something along those lines. If you look at Exodus chapter 32, the golden calf, right? It always had those type of scenarios or those situations. And that's why you always see that reference. Now, the cycle of sin was about to begin again, but, but once Gideon was out of the way. So we're going to continue in verse 33 through 35 to get that account. So we're still in Judges chapter 8, 33 through 35. So it was as Gideon, it was, sorry, so it was as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel again played the harlot, right? There it is, with the Baals and made Baal Bareth their God. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jeroboam, who was Gideon in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. Now you see that name Jeroboam, right? It, it means Gideon, but remember God, the Lord, the, the angel of the Lord called Gideon to break down the altars to Baal. And when the men of Israel woke up and saw that this, was, this happened, they wanted to find out who did it. It was Gideon. They wanted to hurt and kill him. His father stepped in and said, hey, if Baal is such a great God, let him deal with it himself. And that's what Jeroboam means. Basically, let Baal defend his cause. So what we see here is, sorry, that we see that he failed, he failed in that type of sense where he built that altar, they fell to it, but now we see that the children of Israel turn right back to their false gods. And in our message today, we're going to see where God is going to raise up another judge, right? Another flawed judge, whoever serves, whoever's part of ministry. God didn't call us because we're good people, right? That we deserve it, that we're better than you, not, not us. It has nothing to do with that, right? But God still had a purpose and he has a purpose for all of us. And eventually, even through a flawed person like Gideon and then this new judge, his plans still get accomplished. But for a judge to be raised, what does Israel have to do? What's that first cycle? What's that first step? What? Yeah, right. They have to kick that off with sin. And we already got to see it. But now that was the account of Gideon. Like I said, we went back to kind of get some kind of context. Now Gideon is out of the way. Israel is on their own. And immediately there is no judge. So they immediately start falling into sin. So let's go to Judges chapter 13, verse 1. And it's always sad. As I go through the book of Judges, almost every book starts the way Judges chapter 13, verse 1 will start. says again, right? Not the first time. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So we immediately see that they did evil in the sight of the Lord, and that they were worshiping false gods again. And this time, the Philistines were the ones, the enemies that came against them. And they, they were over them for 40 years. Now, we see the Philistines are more of a warlike people versus the Midianites. Midianites were more herdsmen. They were numerous, but because the Philistines were a warlike people, they, they were a tougher enemy. They lived along the southwestern coast of Israel, right? And they controlled five major cities. And from those cities, they would always attack. They would always uh, harass the Israelites. And because they settled along, uh, along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, they were considered seafaring people, which meant that they, they could work with metal better. And because they could be, they work with metal better, they were able to uh, make stronger weapons. When you have stronger weapons, Weapons, your army is that much stronger. So they were an elite type enemy versus the Midianites. Now we know why God would send the Philistines to oppress them because it's the same thing that happens with us. Why does God punish us? He ultimately wants us to repent and turn back to him. In this situation, the Israelites, the Philistines had to come because he wanted to break them. He wanted them to recognize their sin of idolatry again and repent. Now, we see that God always has a purpose for punishing his people. He wanted them to repent and return back to him. The problem here is it took 40 years for Israel to realize, okay, you know what? We can't continue to be in this manner. And they realized that they needed to repent and get right with God. Now we're going to get into the, into the account of where this judge is now going to start to be raised, right? From, from a promised child that hasn't been born all the way to the man. 
So we're going to continue in verses 2 through 5. Same chapter, just picking up 2 through 5. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed now you are barren and have no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, or not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the, Phil the Philistines. Now I underline begin because it doesn't say eliminate, right? Philistines are ingrained in the history of Israel, but right, this is where it's going to begin, that, that, that battle. We see that the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, you're going to have a son. But at this point, she was barren. She couldn't have children, right? She knew that. But God promised her a son. And in verse 5, we see that he was going to be special. What was he called to be? A Nazarite, right? He was called to be a Nazarite, and he would be the judge to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. So God promised her a son. A deliverer or a judge for Israel and he would be a Nazarite and we know that a Nazarite was someone that was set aside right to hold and be fully devoted to God now for you to be the Nazarite you had to, to follow the Nazarite you had to follow the law of the Nazarite so in Numbers chapter 6 verse 1 through 21 that gives us the whole account that if you're going to be a Nazarite here are the rules Right? This is what you're going to end up doing. What I'm going to read is I'm going to read 1 through 8 to kind of give you a context of what's going on so that you understand some of those rules. Numbers chapter 6, verse 1 through 21. I'm going 1 through 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall neither drink vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall, shall come upon his head. Until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. And all the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean, even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister, when they die, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his life, his separation, he shall be holy to the Lord. So it says, normally Israelites would take this Nazarite vow for only a set period of time. But what we see here is during the pregnancy, his mother followed the rules. And not just that, when he was born, she promised that her son would follow the Nazarite rule by not cutting his hair, uh, drink any wine, any type of that grape juice. So now we get to see the angel of the Lord is now going to reappear to Manoah's wife. But this time, Manoah, the husband, is going to be there. So continuing in verse 15 through 20, so we're still in Judges chapter 13, we're going to go 15 to 20 to get this account of what Manoah sees and, and is told. So it says, Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you, and we will prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, that when your words came to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to them, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered upon the rock to the Lord. And he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up towards heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. So Manoah wants to honor this man of God, and he wants to make a big meal. And the angel of the Lord says, no, instead, I want you to set up a burnt offering to the Lord. So Manoah says, okay, well, what's your name so that when all this comes to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord says, I, 
right? It's, it's wonderful. He didn't give him his name. And the reason is, is his name was beyond the comprehension of Manoah and his wife. It was too, too, too powerful, too uh, uh, glorious for him to comprehend, right? Reflecting the character of God. So we see that they prepared the burnt offering. God consumes it in a fire, right? The flame went up to, to heaven and the angel of the Lord went with them. When I was teaching on Gideon, I was talking about the angel of the Lord, right? And who he was. Now, before we answer that, what did, what, what, what did he give him? What was that title he said? He didn't give a name. What did he say? He was. Wonderful, right? Wonderful. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This will tell you exactly who the angel of the Lord is. It's important to understand because this church, right, we embrace Old Testament, New Testament. And this, this is one of the reasons, right? You can't have one without the other. The power that's in the old always points to the new. So in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for unto us a child is born. Let's stop there. Who, who, who is this? Jesus, okay. For un, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Wonderful right? Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So we know the angel of the Lord here is the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. He withheld his name from Manoah and his wife. He received the offering and ultimately ascended into heaven, all pointing to who he was, his identity. Manoah and his wife realized at that instance who they were in front of. And that's why it says at the end of the verse that they fell on their faces, right, in a form of worship. So we move fast, fast forward a little bit. We start to see what the angel of the Lord it, uh, promised is now starting to happen. Just as the Lord said that they would, Manoah and his wife had a son, and his name was Samson, right? Samson grew, and God blessed him. He was set apart to live all of his life as a Nazarite to God. We're going to start to move into seeing Samson's strength on display. So let's move fast forward a little bit more as he's a little bit older now. When Samson was older, he saw a Philistine woman. Pause. What's the issue there? Right. Okay, who are the Philistines at this time? Their enemy, right? So here we go. He saw a Philistine woman, and he told his parents he wanted to marry her. How unequally yoked is that, right? They weren't happy with Samson's choice because that was the daughter of their enemies. But Samson had a weakness for ungodly women. In chapter, uh, we're going to pick that up in Judges chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, where we're going to see Samson lays eyes on her, right? And then we're going to see where he eventually wants to marry her and moves forward with it. So Judges chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. Samson's Philistine wife, right? There's so many issues with that. But now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. Then his father and mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Right? And Samson said to his father, get her for me. She pleases me well. And I underline me because this is the characteristic of Samson. Me, myself, and I. He knows what he is. He knows he's dedicated to God. He understands the rules. And all of this is going against it. But because it's for me, I want you guys to still continue down this path and do, do what, I, what I'm looking to do. So if we continue in verses 4 through 9 says, but his father and mother did not know that it was the Lord that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So Samson went down to Timnah with his, with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn a young goat. Though he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father and mother that he had done this. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. After some time, he returned to get her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in that carcass of the lion. 
He took off, took of it his hands and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So he obviously knew he was wrong. He didn't tell his parents because as a Nazarite, he wasn't allowed to be touching a carcass or a dead body. Even a Jew at that time, right? All of this was against what he was supposed to do. But we see Samson's now venturing here. We're going to see the first time that God gives him his strength. That young lion comes upon him. He tears the young lion apart. He had no weapons, but specifically it says that the spirit of the Lord came upon him. The spirit of the Lord empowered Samson to defend himself. And then after that defeat, he went on to his father's house. Sometime later, the Bible says he comes back through here. And he stops and sees the dead lion and he found, you know, the bees. There's, there was a hive in there. He took the honey and he ate from it. And when he did that, the Bible tells us that he came with an idea for a riddle. That riddle he wanted to deliver at his wedding feast. So he did. He took that riddle in his head and he proposed it to the Philistines who were there. He thought it would be fun and, you know, he'd be messing around with them. And he basically said, here's the riddle. If you can solve it in seven days, I will give you 30 sets of clothing. And this isn't just regular clothing. It's very expensive linen. So it was an expensive bet. If you can't, then you owe me. They knew who he was being married to. So the, the Philistines went to the wife and they pressured her and said, you know, hey, we're going to kill you. We're going to hurt you if you don't find out the answer to that riddle. So there she goes, begging, weeping, crying, pleading with Samson, please, please, please give me the answer. So obviously he gives her the answer. He's, she's the only one that received the answer. She immediately turned and gave it to the Philistines. The Philistines came to Samson and said, I know the answer. They deliver the answer and Samson was furious because the one person he trusted, the one person he knew had the answer, turned on him and gave it to his enemy. So he had to, you know, pay the 30 sets of clothing. So he went down to a local city, Philistine city, and struck down 30 men, took their clothing. After that, paid it off and he went home. And it says that Samson returned to his father's house angry, but he didn't know that his bride was given to the best man of the wedding feast. So Samson returned home. He doesn't know any of this has happened. He doesn't know that his wife is now with another man. And he went to visit her sometime later. So he's thinking everything is fine. Everything is still in place. He has no idea. So now he's coming back. And he's going to be surprised. We get that account in Judges chapter 15, verse 1 through 5. Judges chapter 15, 1 through 5. So after a while, in the time of the wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. And he said, let me go into my wife, into her room, but her father would not permit him to go in. Her father said, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to, the, said to him, to them, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Then Samson went and caught 300 foxes, and he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, put a torch between each pair of tails. When he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burn up both the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyard and the olive groves. So we see Samson, to get back at the Philistines, catches 300 foxes. It doesn't say he did it in one day. It could have been weeks, whatever. But outside of that, he ultimately wanted to burn down their grains and their olive orchards by putting the foxes together and letting them go. Now, obviously, that action is going to cause a reaction of the Philistines. And the Philistines, when they realized who have done this to them, they became angry because they destroyed all their fields. So they sent men of Judah to capture Samson and bring him to them. Now, the men of Judah... When they went, they bound Samson. But the problem I have here is they were local men, right? They were Israelites as well. They feared the Philistines more than their own brother, right? So they should have been looking out for them. Instead, they're doing as the Philistines have instructed them to do. We get that account in verses 15. We're still in 15, 12 through 15. Verses 12 through 15. But they said to them, we have come down to arrest you, right? This is the man of Judah coming to, to Samson. That we may deliver you into the hands of the Philistines. So then Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves, right? He's basically pleading with them. Please don't let it be you. 
right? We're supposed to be looking out for each other. We're supposed to be, right, one. But unfortunately, I get it. You need, they're sending you. I'm going to go with you. But please promise me that you're not going to kill me. Verse 13. So they took him saying, no, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand. But he will surely not kill you. But they surely will not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Leah, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Lord, then the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and the ropes were on his arms became like flax, flax that is burned with fire and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it and he killed a thousand men with it. So we see every time the, the strength that Samson received, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, right? He was in a bad situation. He needed to get out of it. So here he goes. Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him. The jaw, he reaches for a jawbone of a donkey and he slays 1,000 men. Now, God gave Samson this first amazing victory as far as numbers go. God gave him strength to break free of the ropes. He had no weapons except for, right, the jawbone of a donkey. And we see that the victory was not in his weapon, right? It wasn't in his arm and, and how he did these things. It was the spirit of God, which basically gave him that strength to swing it in that manner to be able to kill those thousand men. And it, and it brings me back to we can do all things through him that strengthens us, right? An impossible task, an impossible weapon, but a, a number that no one else could be able to put up with such a weapon. But we all look back and say, okay, well, it was God's strength. So if it was God's strength, then for us, same thing applies, right? There's nothing, nothing that his strength can't see us through. Now, what we do see is multiple judges. I said 14. Samson is the only one. He is a, he's basically a one-man army. He's the only one that was able to fight the enemies on his own because the Spirit of the Lord in, fell upon him specifically, where when we saw Gideon and others, they would always, the Spirit of the Lord would allow the judges to rise up but come alongside the Israelites to fight. He's the only judge that was solo, right? He was that one-man one, one army, but only with, with God next to him. So we know Samson as his strength. We see him now making bad choices, but this is ultimately going to lead to his downfall. We see that Samson judged Israel for 20 years, but like I mentioned before, his weakness was for ungodly women, and that unfortunately was going to be his downfall. So even though Samson knew the Philistines were trying to capture him, he kept putting himself in danger. He wouldn't leave that area, right? He kept letting his heart and eyes take him to these women, the Philistines' women, the, the enemy. He kept trusting the wrong women. Now, he now is going to fall, his eyes are going to fall upon another one. And it says that she, he loved her, right? Not the type of love that is everlasting. It's wow, right? She's, she's that, that lustful type of love. And her name was? Delilah, right? So when the Philistines found out again, they approached uh, Delilah and they said, hey, we want you to find out where his strength comes from. We will give you anything that you ask. Just deliver us to him. We know that that strength wasn't anything physical, that it was God. But Delilah asked Samson to tell her where his strength came from and how he would be defeated. Red flag, right? Here's, your, here's this woman that you love, that you like, and the first question is, how do I defeat you? How do I bring harm to you? Right? That's the complete opposite of someone that we should be looking. But remember, he's of this world. He's not following the path of what has God, God called us to be. That's why it's important that we are equally yoked for many, many reasons. But here is one, right? We're, we're, the, she's looking to harm him. And Samson was so blind to it. But he said, you know what, I'm going to play this game. I'm going to tell her three lies. And the, first, the, the three lies were, if you, bow, if you bind my hands with fresh bowstrings or cords, you tie me with new ropes, or the locks of his hair were woven into loom. She did all three. And every time she did all three, she would call, call upon the Philistines. Philistines are here. He would break up, be strong as ever, and be able to, to break out. Now, Delilah started to become desperate because now he's playing with her and she's realizing it. But not just that. The Philistines are growing uh, impatient with Delilah and, you know, bringing the pressure. And now she begs Samson, please tell me the secret. So finally, finally, Samson gives in. It says that his soul was vexed to death with as, with as much pressure as she was putting on him. And Samson, being such a strong man physically, if you notice, when he's nagged long enough or pushed hard enough, he exposes all of his secrets, right? He's very weak in that manner. But 
unfortunately, Samson gives an account to Delilah as where he even thinks his strength comes from. So in Judges chapter 16, verse 17 through 22, we're going to get the account of where Samson now in his mind and spirit thinks where his strength is, is coming from. Judges chapter 16, verse 17 through 22, that he told her all his heart and said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me. And I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees, and he called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke up from sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. The Philistines took him, put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with brawn fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after he had been shaven. So we see that Samson believed that because he's a Nazarite, that his strength came from his hair. And if I was to be shaven, all that strength would go. And unfortunately, we know, well, unfortunately for Samson, he didn't realize at this point that the power that God gave him was the power to fight the Philistines. So his strength didn't come from his long hair. God told Samson's parents that he would be a Nazarite. So this long hair was just a symbol, a special sign, that special symbol to everyone that this relationship and this is what I do, I do it for God. But when Samson put Delilah before that relationship and exposed that special symbol, God left him. It says Delilah put him to sleep. So much so, right? He didn't even feel his hair even be shaved. That's, that's pretty deep. But, you know, a man came and cut his hair and Samson didn't know that God had left him. It says that he woke up and he was going to rush out there and do exactly what he said he was going to do. That it's always been that way. So Samson assumed that God would always give him his strength. And just like us, we always feel God's going to bless us regardless of what we do. But Samson was spiritually blind to his sin. And he, didn't, he didn't even realize that God had left him. He's no longer with him. So the Philistines come, they capture him. They just don't capture him, right? Don't tell me sin doesn't have consequences. Samson's eyes were gouged out. Doesn't sound like a, a pleasant you know, end to his sin. It doesn't sound like it didn't go unpunished. They bound him and they brought him to Gaza where he was a prisoner, grinding wheel in, or basically pushing a grinding wheel in a prison. So he sinned by letting women get in between his, his relationship and his ultimate obedience to God. He told the secret to Delilah and ended up blind, blinded and imprisoned by his enemies. But you would think, wow, this is it. He's no longer can be used. But God still was in control, regardless of all the hiccups, all the mistakes that Samson went, you know, went down with his life. God wasn't finished with uh, Samson yet. So now we see 3,000 Philistines come together. There's a party happening, and they're gathering. They're basically there to worship their false god, Dagon. And they called for Samson to come up. They wanted to expose and show and make fun, right? This is a man of God. Look at him. Defeat it. He's our prisoner now. Now, when he was led up, there was a boy leading him, and he asked the boy, hey, put me between the pillars that hold this, this home together. And we're going to ultimately see that God uses Samson one more time, but Samson ultimately has to give his life to receive that last victory. So we're going to see it in continuing in Judges chapter 16, verses 28 through 31. 28 through 31. And Samson called upon, unto the Lord and said, O Lord, remember me. I pray thee and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may, may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. 
and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at this death were more than which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought, up, brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Ishtar in the burying place of Manoah and his father. And he judged Israel for 20 years. So we see Samson in verse 28. He prayed to God to remember him, right? Remember me. He's basically calling out to God, right? Yahweh, oh Lord, He's, base, he's trying to repent. He's realizing at that point, in his lowest point, that he needed to repent. That repentance would have restored the relationship that he needed to defeat the Philistines one more. So he asked God for strength. He wanted to demonstrate his humility to God. I know my strength comes from you. Remember me, forgive me, but restore what has always come from you. So Samson pushed the two middle pillars supporting the house, and the house collapsed, killing Samson with it. So Samson was willing to die one more time, as I mentioned, to, ch to achieve one final victory for the Lord. God gave strength to Samson to knock down those two enormous pillars. But it mentioned here that the people died in this era were more than the Philistines that he's ever killed in his whole life, right? That one instant, he killed more Philistines than his whole life prior. But like I mentioned before, Samson was different than the other judges. He was always solo, but he did have something in common with the Israelites. He always fell. He didn't fall into idolatry, but let's be honest, right? When I ask the kids upstairs, idolatry, right? They know false gods, but they know now What's idolatry? Anything that gets in the way of God in your time. And they start throwing tablets and cell phones and video games and friends and money and fame and school, all this other stuff, right? It's, it's a reality check. Just because it's a physical, false, tangible, false worshiping of a God here, we need to also understand that we can also have idolatry in our life in the sense of whatever we find ourselves spending more time in, that's our God. If it's not God and it's this and God, then we just need to come and, you know, check our heart. Life gets busy. The enemy is going to preoccupy you. I have two kids. I have my wife. I have work. I have school. I have travel. I have so many different things. Trying to study for this was, was difficult, but the Lord allows me to make that opportunity, but it's also a sacrifice. It's not going to come easy, right? We got to be able to give up those things so that we could be fed. I like to eat. I like to eat probably more than I should, but when you look at your spirit, why do we why do we always let that go far hungrier than our physical, right? We always forget about it. How, how can we be strong in the time that we need to be strong, especially us men, as far as leaders of our home? How can we lead a family? How can we stand? How can we teach? How can we provide if we're not spiritually strong? We might be physically, but if we're not spiritually strong, how could God ever move? How, can ever, how could God ever use us? How can he ever be that pillar in time of trouble? Right? So I encourage you, just because these, they're, they're worshiping false gods, and my gosh, Israel never l learns their lesson. 14 different judges are over a course of 300 years. I'm 42, and I can say, gosh, after 42 years, right, you would think I would get better day in and day out. But no, when I wake up, the flesh wakes up with me, and it just becomes a battle from, you know, from beginning to end. But what we see here is Samson would always put women before, before God. And unfortunately, when he did that, God left him. And these godly women, unfortunately, left him um, removed from God. His blessings were God. And when Samson finally repented, God heard his prayer and answered it. So that should be an encouragement to us. Just because you sin, as much as you sin, as big or small you think that sin is, all God is ever looking for is repentance. That last portion before God can even begin to work. He always has to deal with false worship. He always needs to deal with repentance. He always wants the altars removed from the camp. Then he wants you to repent so that you can have that restoration. But God can't move in your life until you remove what's in his way. And that's you putting it in his way, not he put it in your way, right? He wants you to repent and turn back to him and worship him. Now, you look at Samson and you go, wow, that, that's a lot of, of bad information. How can this guy be a man of God? It's sad to say that Samson really didn't have many things that we could boast about. But God chose him, revealing to himself, right? He, God came to his parents and said, listen, this is your child. This is who he's going to be. He raised, he's going to raise up. He's going to be a Nazarite. But he didn't necessarily follow all the rules, even though he knew the rules. She would bear, he, she said, the spirit, the angel of the Lord said, you're going to have the son. He's going to be special. He's going to save his people. This son was to be set apart and meant to walk a pure life. 
But instead, right, we get to see that instead of being pure and obeying God, Samson also gave, he always gave himself over to lust, right? That was his choice. Me, myself, and I, as I mentioned before, whatever works for me, I get what I need to do. But if it's going to please me, I'm going to do it. But God still used him. Did he not? He's, he's mentioned here in Judges. God still used him. And it's incredible to see Samson, he's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, as a man of faith, right? If he was a disappointment or he didn't fulfill what God was trying to achieve, why would he be relisted in the New Testament? But that should serve as a reminder to us, right? That Jesus, if he is our Lord and he is our Savior, Savior, that we can be sure that when we fail, which we will, we will fail miserably, that he still can use us. He still would look upon us and say, you know what? Your life is still worth what I need it for, right? I can still use you to bring glory to me. So in this situation, this story in itself should encourage us not to stop growing when we fail, right? Put our faith in God and let's not give up, right? If we're not obedient, get obedient. Learn, learn to be willing to hear what God has to say. Repent and then trust God to work in our lives, in our weaknesses. Don't try to do it on your own strength. We always have these decisions and these great ideas that we should be able to do. And what you have to realize is where you're weak, like I mentioned before, he is strong. I always call for teachers. I always call for help. I always call for assistance. And I always get certain comments, uh, I'm nervous or I'm not good at this. And I'm like, and I grab, you're, you're perfect. That's exactly what God is looking for. Because guess who's going to get the credit when you're up there teaching? God, not you. And that's the way God calls us to serve. So as another encouragement, anytime there's something up here that says, hey, we need help or we need help in the nursery or we need help in the youth or we need help cleaning or we have all these dates coming up for VBS. Well, I can't do that. I can't do it. Well, yes, you can't do that, but God will be there to give you the strength to do it. So why not try it and allow God to work through you? But what we see here is, is God used Samson, right? His characteristics, he was very disobedient and he, he, was, he was always doing what he wanted. But we ultimately see God use him. But please don't take that and be like, oh, okay, you know what? I can do wrong and God's still going to use me, right? That justifies disobedience. And it should help us understand that even the disobedience of man, it doesn't throw God off. He knew exactly what he was getting with Samson. God's not sitting there going, oh my gosh, that just happened. My plan is derailed. What am I to do now? Where do I go from here? Right? It, it doesn't happen that way. God is not surprised and he's not derailed when, when these situations come. All he's looking for is pure obedience. So we never, we have to remember never to get lost, right, in who we think we are. We need to always make sure that we give glory to God. And that's very easy to do, right? Affirmation from your surrounding family and, and, and brothers and sisters is very easy to receive. But you have to understand, I'm up here teaching God's word. You're down there and helping in different classes. I have teachers and assistants giving God's word. Thank you, Lord, for all of those teachers. Thank you for parents bringing your kids here, right? Thank you for sitting in the sanctuary. It's important that you guys are fed here. I pray that this isn't the only place you're fed. I, I encourage you that if you're, you're only receiving the word here, I encourage you to take it home and also learn to build and have your own relationship and see what the Lord has for you and your family through devotions and things like that. But there is encouragement in Samson's story, right? We see God's faithfulness. We see his grace and mercy. We see that his sovereign guidance, and he is able to use a broken vessel and still receive glory. So amen, right? Because I'm, I'm a broken vessel, and the Lord it will be able to use me as long as I remain in that state. I will always remain a broken vessel. I always want to be remembered as a broken vessel, because as soon as I think that I'm shiny new and I, I should be at the highest pedestal, I have lost all vision and lost all right center on Christ. And then it becomes a me and not a him, and at that point, it's worthless. But I did come across a quote, and I'm going to finish here. Um, I liked it because it was, it, was, it was great. I've always heard, you know, uh, great man of God, right? That, that's basically saying, right? Uh, I'm sorry, that I'm great, right? But th this, this quote came across, and, and, I, I, and I, like I said, I end here. It says, there is no such thing as a great man of God. Only man of a great and merciful God, right? So it puts us in perspective that in no way can that title of great ever be accompanied with me. 
because I have nothing to give, right? I can, I, can, I can be on my best and it's still miss the mark. But I take joy, I, take, I put my hope and I put my faith in a, you know, a merciful, loving, powerful God. He makes me great and without him, I'm nothing. So please understand that this story, this histor historic event, right? We don't say stories because this is history. This is what we stand by. Those children know that this is history. Regardless of what's being told out here, the Bible is our history, right? This is where it began. And this is food for thought. This is experience. This is, we get to see Gideon. We get to see Samson at, at work. Don't look past it and think, well, this doesn't really necessarily apply to me. It applies in so many different ways. He lived his life with lustful thoughts and lustful and his lust dictated him versus being spirit fed and letting God work amongst him. So I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to pray. I'm, uh, do we have one more song? Who's it? Yep. One more song. But I pray that you guys are blessed. I hope that you guys have a great day off. I hope the kiddos have fun and, and everyone stays safe. And I hope you walk away with just that much more knowledge, right? About our Lord and savior. So let me end in prayer and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Lord, just for this day. Thank you for just being with us. Thank you for your word. May it strengthen us. Just be with us this weekend, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We give you the honor, the glory, everything, Lord. Without you, we're nothing. With you, we're everything. So may we always stay close to you and always remember that, Lord. Be with uh, families, friends. Be with our church, anyone that's sick. Um, anyone that even not sick, Lord, just be, with, be their hope and give them that joy that only you can give. We love you. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.